नमस्वी अतिराजाय विवेकानंद सूरये सचित सुख स्वरूपाय स्वामीने तापहारिणे आय एम हॅपी टू पार्टिसिपेट इन दिस फंक्शन and my warm greetings to all the devotees of ram uh, shri sharda math bangalore today i am going to actually i want to give some pictures I don't know how much it will be useful for a, another type of meditation i should say now let us first take ram krishna's vision One day Sri Ramakrishna had a vision in which his mind soared high and high leaving behind all, all this earth and even the devatas it finally entered a place where even the devatas could not enter then he had the vision of seven rishis sitting in a close proximity of the supreme it seems they had no desire whatsoever Let us compare this beautiful vision with a description from the scriptures. Trisuparna mantra says, Hiranmayo, Hiranmayo vetaso madhya asam tasmin suparne madhukyut kulai bhajan naste madhu devatabhyaha tasya sate haraya sapta tire swada duhanam amritasya dharam This gives a wonderful description of the seven rishis. It says that they are in the close proximity of supreme divine. They are also continuously participating in the cosmic yajna with the divine. Here it is visualized that all our kriyas, karmas, everything from the innumerable jivas of this universe whether it is mental or physical in fact the impact of this entire humanity is continuously falling like a river flowing into this cosmic yajna this is the havis that is falling into this yajna this comprises the whole of the universe and these supreme souls they are purifying and sending it back as a blessing and they are most unselfish they do not care for partaking it or interested in that they constitute a cosmic dynamo supreme purifying machine purifying all our thoughts and actions out of infinite compassion here note the word haraya haraya sapta tire swadha duhanam haraya means smarana matrena papa harina ha that means just by remembrance they are able to burn the sins means if you can remember them commonly we mistake them with our known rishis seven rishis atri angira pulastya pula krito marichi vasishta but they are only they are gotra pravartakas or prajnrators but these seven rishis whom we are speaking about they are all the being surpass surpassing everybody even these rishis in their viveka vairagya and other divine qualities far superior to the devatas also and saints also somewhere i have read vigyanananda maharaj reminiscences he had a vision of saptarishis once when he visited a mandir dedicated to saptarishi he actually he had a in his deep meditation He was thrilled to have the vision, blessed vision of the seven rishis. He identifies them with Sanak, Sanatan, Sananda, uh, and the others. Nara, maybe Nara, Narayan, and others. So these are actually 
the spiritual jains and the vedic mantra says they are almost merged with divine their presence is continuously merged with divine they are immersed in this deep meditation and we know that thakur brought one of them down and with a beautiful description you must have all read so i'm not going to repeat it here so many is one of these rishis who are completely spiritually oriented they have nothing to do with samsara and then thakur brought him down from the sakanda loka thakur had to do a lot of struggle with this because maya cannot bind him swami ji uh, thakur has to put forth a lot of effort just like breaking the hearts and giving swami ji all sorts of trouble in this world and finally when he accepted mother kali that day swami thakur felt relieved because pure gold cannot do any work only when we mix with copper it it can be of use when it swami ji came down this maya screen space time continuum then only he could understand the misery of this world then only his compassionate heart bled for that and then only he was able to do thakur's work otherwise he would have disappeared for long back into that akanda loka so this is vivekananda we started with who is vivekananda now how he adopted this name also is very interesting it so happened that during parivrajak days he went on changing his name to hide his identity he started with vividishananda then satchidananda then so many other names we don't know and finally he ended with vivekananda other than sri ramakrishna guru bai could best understand him uh sometime i remember the turiyanand maharaj saying when swami ji was with us none of us could understand who was he just like gopis when they played gopas when they played with shri krishna they never understood who was he just like fish playing with moon reflection thinking that they are his one of them but when moon disappears then they will understand where they are similarly when swami ji disappeared he understood what we lost otherwise we were thinking he was only our friend a playmate but now we cannot even fathom his greatness and charat maharaj in his famous shloka anitya drishesh vichya nityam a beautiful adjectives he gives the second one he gives viveka jananta nimagna chittam viveka ja ananda nimagna chittam that means the one who enjoys the joy out of this discrimination depends on nothing external his ananda is purely out of discrimination now i want to give you here a picture from his days in london in 1995 96 1895 1896 mr stardy and miss muller who were his hosts in london had very very queer ideas about austerity they always thought that indian yogi should be like this like that yogi should be very austere and when they practice they should practice on the bare necessities they should not even require anything um they should be able to live any in any condition so what they did you see we can't even imagine they kept samiri in a underground cellar imagine foggy and depressing weather of london in winter when londoners used 
profusely coal for everything. So you can imagine that coal, coal fumes everywhere. Imagine an underground cellar where there is no light, no electricity, electric light was not there. No light from outside. Swamiji was given such a room to stay and boil radish to eat. Now what did he do? Did he grumble or even say anything to them? After a day's tiring lecture and other works, Swamiji would retire to such a cellar. He was not getting sleep, but not because of depressing situation. In his own words, he said, After laying down for a few minutes, I used to feel a fountain of joy rising inside me. I could not even lay down any more, but I used to dance with joy. So now imagine what type of joy it must be. When missionaries saw that the man, people were drawn to him like iron to magnet and missionary income fell by millions. They reverted to path of abuse. They threatened the innocent audience. They started to pour on his head all sorts of personal abuse. Surprisingly, he remained absolutely calm. He did not react to any personal abuse. At the same time, when the audience went mad after him, then also he took that with a smile on his lips like a child. Tulya Ninda Susir Mauni Santushto Ena Kenati. Here is a piece of reminiscence from an old Californian lady. Her name is Mrs. Burgett. She, it seems, she attended Parliament of Religion. And now when she went back, she carried a poster of Swamiji, life-size photo. Here, uh, that time in 1899, Swamiji was in Risley Manor. He came to America second time. We call that Great Summer at Risley. There his companions were, I mean, uh, actually his uh, host was, uh, Mrs. Betty and her sister Maclo. All big people were invited. It was uh, veritably like a heaven. Swamiji's company and uh, such a beautiful atmosphere all around. The people were enjoying like anything. That time Maclo received a telegram that her brother is extremely ill and is about to die and is in California. So she rushed back to California. Then she saw her brother dying in this Mrs. Bludger's cottage. And just at his head, a life-size photo of Swamiji was hung. She was so surprised because she was coming from Swamiji presence. And here she saw the Swamiji's photo again. So she asked Mrs. Bridget, saying, Who is he? Whose photo is this? Then Mrs. Bridget answered with all the dignity of 80 years, stood up straight and said, If ever God has come to earth, it is he, it is he. Then MacLeod, in a teasing way, she said, How do you know it is God? Then Mrs. Bridges said, Well, my dear, I was there. I was there in that parliament at 1893. When the lecture was over, I saw uh, when he spoke, see his sisters and brothers of America, 6,000 people stood up for something which they knew not what. And when his speech was barely over, I saw thousands of them hurrying, running on the benches just to touch the hem of his uh, robe and feel blessed. Then I told myself, well, my lad, if you can bear this onslaught, then you are indeed God. That moment I saw him taking it like a 
innocent child with a smile. Then I understood he is indeed God. So I brought this photo from there. So we can understand he took this praise as well as blame in the same way. And it didn't depend on any outside thing. That is what we call Atmara. Now take another beautiful adjective. Viveka Danaika Vinoda Shilam. Viveka Danaika Vinoda Shilam. The one who gives the power, discriminating power in a playful mood. Uh, playful mood. It is not difficult for him to bestow this discriminating power on anyone whom he come across, for anybody whom he thinks who can, just playfully he can impart this highest knowledge. Now, when Swamiji came back to our country, the entire country was sleeping. In one rousing call, he said, My India, arise! And the whole of the country responded. With a touch or a glance, he could impart highest knowledge to people by grace of Sri Ramakrishna. Oh, one or two small stories regarding this. We all know the story of a singer who sang Prabhu Mero Avaguna Chitanadoro. The people say it is a turning point in his life. Remember this incident in Khetri when Swamiji resisted, no, no, I cannot go to that court's musician's this thing, uh, music concert. I cannot go. I am a sannyasin. Then this song he heard. Immediately his pride came down. He said, What? I am priding myself as sannyasi. And this lady today, if there is God's grace, she can attain anything. And so she came back just to tell as excuse. Some say it is a turning point, just like Shankaracharya facing Chandala. No doubt. But how many of us know that what was the impact of this on the life of this Maina Bai, whom Swamiji addressed as Mother, Ma? Mother, you have opened my eyes. Yes, there was a tremendous change. On hearing this one word, Ma, she became a completely changed person. She left her profession as a court singer. She took the uh, her life change. She became a sadhika. Again, now we come across another story, similar one, where he removed the spiritual blocks so playfully. We come across another uh, incident in Madras when he felt that something has gone wrong and his mother is not well in Calcutta. His friends took him to Epishat Siddha. It was, I think, 1893 beginning or 90, uh, 1893 beginning. That time, a man was sitting in that smashan. He was himself looking like Pishati. He was looking like a devil. Uh, he was actually playing with their spirits. And now he only told Swamiji, yes, your mother is all right and what not. But because Swamiji came and talked to him, an occasional talk or a touch changed the course of his life. When Swamiji came back in 1897, he noticed that this man is sitting like a gentleman with along, along with the other gentleman in the same sabha. And then Swamiji even came down and embraced him. This changed the whole course of his life. He left all this siddha, or this playing with spirits, came back to the spiritual sadhana once again and took 
to spiritual path in earnest or uh, as an earnest seeker and there is another example of kiddy singar velu modeliyar whose life was changed with a touch he was a like gnostic he didn't believe in anything spiritual he said he has come with the purpose of testing swami ji so everybody was sitting quietly and this kiddy took into his head he was a professor of physics and chemistry so he wanted to test and see swami ji so he got up and that that time swami ji was telling the audience that the yogis are having extraordinary powers they can change the thought currents of the people who come in touch with them they can raise them to their level like this then with all resolution kiddy walked towards swami ji swami ji said no no kiddy, uh, don't touch don't touch because swami ji understood he is coming to touch him if you touch your samsara will be burned but kiddy decided he touched swami ji in front of so many people they saw his whole hand was shaking as if he got a electric shock and then he fell at swami ji's feet swami ji only said kiddy what did you do what did you do your samsara is burnt just after that the friends who had brought him here they tried and persuaded him but kiddy refused to go to home he was a changed person he became a sanyasi just then and he was not able to take this household life anymore then there are innumerable people who attended the lectures of um, swami ji both in east and west when someone asked swami ji how many disciples you are having swami ji in the west he immediately he replied yes thousands what do you mean by thousands did you initiate but then swami ji need not have to initiate he only what he did was his speech his talk was enough his words were mantras they could lift the person to anything any level his very words were mantras so that is what swami ji said when he said yes i mean i got thousands of disciples sometimes he has said do you think it's simply lecture simply speech how much energy i have given to that Here I want to recount what Lara Glenn, Miss Lara Glenn, said. She said, in 1893, she wanted to attend Parliament, but a crisis in the family stopped her. Then, at the end of the Parliament lectures, some padres visited them. Then. he started describing at length the whole proceedings of the parliament then he asked suddenly do you think whom do you think carried the entire audience with him they started guessing said maybe that uh, harvard's professor this archbishop this and so on and so on but this padri went on saying no 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 ultimately he said do you know who carried the entire audience with him say hidden a hindu or swami vivekananda and devamata was so very surprised this laragin was surprised to hear this because she has never heard such a thing now she had a secret intention that she should attend swami ji's lecture in 1896 she got the opportunity when she came to new york she saw that there were some announcements that swami ji is giving lectures on raj yoga or four yogas in such and such a hall she went to attend it 
well before. But then she saw that the people were pouring in and in. So many people came. They filled in all the places. Even the window sills, they sat. Even the, on the basins, they sat. And even the staircase were filled. And they even stood on the roads just to hear a humming sound of his voice. Because nothing could be heard from the street except that humming voice. Then the majestic presence, Swamiji came in. She says that so many praise and say, how wonderful was Swamiji's personality. But within few seconds, the, his entire personality disappeared. There was a voice alone ringing in the void. We were lifted up to some unknown world. On his wings, the gates of heaven swung open and we walked in. So, you can understand the powerful words of Swamiji, which could lift thousands of audience at a time. When she came back, she says, there was pin drop silence. Audience have left already. So she must have experienced a taste of samadhi. Now, that was the power of Samadhi's words. Now, I want to finally give you a small picture of, from an adjective from another shloka. Karuna Kataksha Vinikshepa Daksha. That means the one whose glance is full of compassion, compassionate glance, who is an expert in putting this compassionate glance. How proficient he was in throwing the compassionate glance and how wonderful was its changing capacity, this one, life-changing capacity. We can give many examples for this. One story I want to pick up is from Mrs. Edith Allen. In future she got the name Viraja Devi. She says, she was a young person at that time, about 20, 22 like that. But she dabbled with something like black magic or somebody like that. Got into that hypnotic world and her had a nervous breakdown and entered such a dark world, she says. Not a single ray of hope was entering that. My world was completely dark. I could not experience love or compassion from my fellow beings or even from my loving husband and friends. I felt all alone, depressed and I was leading a life, a hopeless life. No coherent thinking anymore, anywhere. I could not concentrate on any work. In this condition, Mr. Allen, her husband, came to know about Samiji and started attending his lectures. He became an ardent devotee and admirer of Samiji. He even started helping him uh, to announcements and all these things. And he was six feet tall and a military person. Swamiji used to call, See, Alan, you are also military and I am also military. And then one day it so happened that when Alan started announcing from the stage, he suddenly felt he was a pygmy by the side of Swamiji. And so he got down from the stage, started announcing from the ground. So this Alan felt that Edith can be improved if she can be brought to Samiji's lecture. So he coaxed and said, oh, no, you must, once you must at least attend Swamiji's lecture. She said, what is the use? I cannot understand anything. I am simply, I am a lost case. I am a hopeless case. Please leave me. But then Ellen pursued it and she came to Swamiji's lecture. She was sitting dumb and then at the end of the lecture, Swamiji noticed her and said, Madam, 
If you want to meet me personally, you can come to such and such a address, such and such a time. So she became bold enough to go there. But then the landlady said, No, no, Swamiji is now having some urgent meetings. He will go there. I don't think he will have time to meet you. But she says, No, I stood my in this thing. I didn't leave the place. Said, No, I must meet Swamiji. Swamiji told me that he, you can come, so I will. I have come. Then she said, okay, then sit and wait. So Edith was sitting in a corner and waiting. Finally Swamiji came out, he was having disheveled hair, and then he was chanting to himself Gita, some shlokas. She was sitting quietly. He came near and said, Madam, well, Madam. Immediately she felt that as if the flood gates were open, the tears started coming like anything. She wept and wept. All her darkness, all her this thing were coming out. And Swamiji just left her as it is. Went on going to and fro, to and fro, and chanting Gita in the same wonderful tone and filling the whole place with his beautiful chanting. After some time, he came back and said, well, madam, you can come again. So she left the place. But this time her life has changed. She felt that everything is radiant around. Everything has become cheerful. Even the stones look like opals, she says. And the world has transformed into a beautiful world. So that is the healing started. Then Swamiji said in the next one, yes, you can come. You can help me in small things. So she started coming to Swamiji. He will say, small, small works he will make her do. Cut the vegetables, do this, do that. And even he taught, you call me Baba. Small children in India, they call their father as Baba. So you are my daughter, hereafter you will call me Baba. So she started calling like that. The atmosphere was so joyful, so uplifting. She said, now, Swamiji, can I call my friends? He said, no, this is only for you. They don't need it. So long afterwards she understood he was giving a sort of healing through this company. And he, he never used to say, you go and meditate. Instead he would say, I will meditate for you. So even if he is going to class, he will not coax her. He will say, I will meditate for you, don't worry. But Edith was under the impression that Swamiji didn't, didn't know what happened to my life, what all blunders I have committed. But Swamiji did know. So when Swamiji finally returned to India, he called and said, Edith, my dear, if you ever fall into abyss once again, call on me. So that moment Edith understood. Yes, Swamiji knew everything. And not only that, even in 1950s, she recalls and says, even today, maybe Swamiji is away in space and time, but I know that Swamiji will respond to my call if I call on him. So that was the wonderful touch of Swamiji. The Karuna Kataksha Vinikshe Padaksha. I, I can't go on continuing because the time is also limited. And I have given you a few pictures which are favorite for me, even for meditation. The wonderful things which take us very near to Thakur Ma Swamiji. We get a personal touch through them. This is what Mary Louis Burke says that when Swamiji came to America, he touched the very heart of the mothers. He came to our doors like a dear son, a dear brother. He, he not only came to our homes, touched our heart and heart. We were waiting for him. 
just like the thirsty people were waiting for water, pure water in the desert. So if the sudden spring of nectar comes in the desert, what happens? The people go mad, like that the people rushed for him. So when Swamiji started from India, Mother never revealed him what is waiting for him. He thought that he is going for the uplifting of Indians. But when the new chapter opened, he saw how spiritually thirsty they were. And he came up like a nectar for which they were thirsting. So that is, with one drop of Krupa, the lives became blessed. Uh, with this, I come to end. I pray to Thakur Masamiji to pour on all of you their loving blessings and the is my heartiest prayer to them. Uh, my, let them give us solace, let them give peace, and let them give peace to this turmoil world. This is my earnest prayer. This I come to the end. Namashri Yati Rajaya Vivekananda Suraye Satchit Sukha Swarupaya Swamine Tapaharine Namaste to all of you.